let it be a dance we do. May I have the dance with you? Through the good times and the bad times too. Let it be a dance, let a dancing song be heard. Play the music, say the words. Good evening. This is Mae Brussel. It's tape number 449. It's July the 11th, 1980, and it's side one of the tape. Harris and Salisbury from the New York Times was on KGO Radio in San Francisco. That's an ABC affiliate, so I'm sure he's traveling all around the country selling his new book, and you might hear him on various radio stations. But one of the com- the commentators who was interviewing him was talking about the New York Times, uh, often accused of being too liberal by the Reaganites and the far, far right. And Salisbury was explaining that uh, the founder of the New York Times, Adolph Oakes, came from the South, that most of the writers are from the South, and that the paper was bought in 1896, and that from 1896 until 1971, it was the opinion of the owners of the New York Times that the Times represented the federal government. It should be a branch of the federal government, he said. I was listening in the car and taking notes like, man, I couldn't tape record it, but those were exactly his words. And I remembered how at the time John Kennedy was murdered, that's when I became really politically active and interested. The New York Times published the Warren Report and had a supplement, 20 or 30 pages, a little condensed version in case you didn't want to read the other one, assuring the whole world that there was no conspiracy Nobody was involved except Lee Harvey Oswald, the loner. The uh, policy of the New York Times was to represent the White House or the opinion of the White House. In the book, The Kingdom and the Power, by Gay Talese, uh, he writes about the history of the New York Times, and there's been other books about the New York Times. But he gives a quote from Oakes, the owner of the New York Times, in quotes, to give the news impartially without fear or favor, yet prevailed. That's the kind of selling of Talese of the kingdom of the power. It's untrue that they give it impartially. The turning point, according to Salisbury, came June 13, 1971. That's when the Pentagon Papers were published, and that is when I began doing my public work. I was a private researcher from 63 to 71 and was invited down to the radio station to talk about the meaning of the newspaper breaking the story at the time. And that is the important thing, the meaning of the media going against the President of the United States, Richard Nixon, and the White House to tell a truth about Vietnam or the role of Henry Cabot Lodge in suggesting the murder of Diem, being part of the murder of Diem. And uh, this was a break. And when I got on the air, and I still have the original one-hour broadcast that began nine years of continuous broadcasting, I took two off from KLRB, the last two, but I believe I'm going to go back now because of Ronald Reagan so close to becoming president and with the draft signing, uh, beginning the registering, I believe I'll go back on KLRB um, a- again. I've been doing my radio work by cassettes, and I think I'll go back on the station. I'm thinking about it seriously. But the point is that the turning point in American history, I said in 1971, came when people in the newspaper began to do their own investigative work and saw things were wrong and stopped being so quiet, say, about the murder of John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Medgar Evers, uh, Malcolm X, the killing of the black leaders, the use of police for goon squads, and particularly the murder of John Kennedy. I have the original tape of that first broadcast and every broadcast I've done since. And I said the biggest story, of course, is the murdering of the President of the United States by our own government and federal agencies. Well, since 1971, there has been a mushrooming of investigators, of journalists, muckrackers, conspiracy theorists, they call us, who throw out as many facts as the other side throws out and can document them a far sight better. Also, uh, during this interview, Harrison Salisbury explained that Richard Nixon was going to run against Senator Ted Kennedy in 1972. Uh, he didn't mention it, but I know that they had arranged the White House plumbers, the CIA, and that team to kill Mary Jo Kopechny and blame the murder on uh, Senator Ted Kennedy. But the coup de grace was that they didn't want 
Ted Kennedy running for president against Nixon, and of course the possibility that the assassination of his brothers may come up in the campaign. The way to end all of that was to suggest that uh, John Kennedy ordered the murder of Diem in Southeast Asia, uh, get even with the part in the Pentagon Papers that talks about Henry Cabot Lodge, uh, Nixon's buddy running mate, you know, uh, uh, down there in Southeast Asia, overturning the country. They were going to divert it, and they brought E. Howard Hunt in from the CIA with the State Department Pentagon Papers for $100 a day, right into the White House, going through massive files of State Department cables, seeing which one he could closely link John Kennedy to, to the murder of DM. And then in 1972, at the time of the Watergate arrest in June, one year later, E. Howard Hunt was caught with files, scissors, razor blades, you name it, uh, rewriting history in the right under the dome of the White House. From that moment on, it became very clear that you no longer can trust any document that becomes declassified that's been arranged and forged or handled. He should have been prosecuted for that, and nobody holding top secret documents should be allowed by the President of the United States to be rewritten to blame a past president or any other single person for the murder of another person. The implications on that are tremendous. The fact that he was never charged is a reality we have to live with and know it will happen later or is happening right now. But I thought it was interesting that from, 19, from 1896, uh, Adolf Ochs and his family and the publishers went along with the government. They broke in 1971. And then uh, beginning at that time, mushroomed this whole industry of investigative journalism and books and articles and people taking a closer look at what is said by public officials or prosecutors or district attorneys and doing a little research on their own. Uh, speaking of research on their own, in 1974, I wrote the SLA is the CIA, and in the newspaper yesterday, there was a very important article in the San Francisco Chronicle. I don't know if you got it back east or not. Um, Marilyn Baker was the newswoman that covered the entire SLA story with Charles Bates. Charles Bates was from the FBI. He was trained in London. He was in Chicago when his FBI man was ordered to kill Fred Hampton. Uh, the Black Panther leader. He was in the Justice Department at the time of Watergate, covering that up. And then he was flown to San Francisco to be head of the FBI because the uh, counterintelligence group from California that set up the Manson family was getting ready to set up this political kidnapping in the United States, the first large political kidnapping. Charlie Bates worked with Marilyn Baker. She was the KPIX Channel 5 newswoman who wrote the book Exclusive. And uh, her name came out of the news today, that uh, big article in the case of the mafia boss, Mr. Bonanno. He's being charged with destroying uh, records of his uh, office in Los Gatos and with his links to organized crime. And the Bonanno family, in their defense, has brought in Marilyn Baker. And the article says, Bonanno case ex-TV personality is called an FBI spy. Former San Francisco TV news personality Marilyn Baker who has been accused of being an FBI informant working against Bonanno. Uh, she's a woman who had access to the files and records of the organized crime mafia family and kept them. Uh, the 21-year-old secretary paramour of a member of the Bonanno family uh, gave them these records to Marilyn Baker, and she kept them. And the FBI is prosecuting Bonanno for destroying his files when the FBI had the files and Marilyn Baker had access to those files. The defense attorney for Bonanno says she was treated so royally because um, she, Marilyn Baker worked with the FBI, closely with the FBI, and they've been treating her like a queen. Uh, she worked with the organized crime strike force. While she held the records of Bonanno's office business dealing, they were prosecuting Bonanno on charges that he had destroyed the records. She came in on the excuse of making a film of the organized crime family, and when she did, she was under the pay of the Westinghouse Network. Westinghouse also sponsored uh, many other fronts for intelligence, and uh, there's no time to go into all of them now. General Electric and Westinghouse were notorious. Marilyn Baker is now working at a radio station in Palm Springs. She's nestled under the palm trees with Mr. Annenberg of organized crime fame and Spiro Agnew and Gerald Ford, who now is on the board of Flying Tigers. I mentioned last week 
airline linked with heroin in Southeast Asia and Vietnam and drugging our soldiers and Vietnamese, the CIA connections, the Annenbergs, the Frank Sinatra, Gerald Ford, Marilyn Baker is a radio woman, uh, an FBI woman covering radio stations down in Palm Springs, probably in case any one of these particular people were assassinated, she'd be the major newswoman or anchor woman down there to cover that story. It did my heart good to see Marilyn Baker linked to the FBI because when I wrote in 1974, the SLA is the CIA, I had a section on the uh, FBI operations, the COINTEL program, the Tom Charles Houston that uh, Gerald Ford and Richard Nixon covered up, the counterintelligence program that now will be in the hands of Ronald Reagan. And the important thing about the role of Marilyn Baker or Charlie Bates is that they represent, uh, as does the Howard Hughes industry and Intertel that came into Vegas, they represent that faction of law enforcement that's taking over the crime syndicate and pushing it aside so that the money goes into the what is known as the Irish or the respectable mafia, the men playing golf, buying the country clubs, the resort hotels, the uh, duplication of these African safari uh, compounds. Uh, they're a little less sophisticated than Disneyland, but the whole resort area has been a respectable place for organized crime to take money from prostitution, um, blackmail, extortion, uh, narcotics, you name it, child pornography, whatever, and stick it into places like golf courses and recreation areas. One of the subscribers to my tape sent an article from the New York Post, actually, in March 1980, explaining why uh, the godfather from Philadelphia was murdered just when Abscam was breaking. Angelo Bruno and uh, Carmine Galanta and Anthony Russo, they mentioned, uh, were just a few of the people killed recently, just in this past time, because the Irish mafia is taking over from the Italian. And as the article goes on to explain, this is in the New York Post, Businessmen are looking to deal with guys that aren't always walking in and out of courthouses. Uh, they're mu uh, muscling into Atlantic City as they muscled into the Nevada, Las Vegas area, move the Jewish Italian out. Meyer Lansky is an old, tired dog of the syndicate, knows too much probably to kill him. He probably has diaries salted all over the place. But most of the gangland people are being moved out. At the time that the, uh, remember the, uh, the Gambino family, Mr. Eppolito, was photographed with Rosalind Carter. Uh, James, Jimmy, Eppolito were both murdered, the excuse being uh, they were too visible with the Carters. But it also be that the Carters don't want to be seen with the crime figures. How many people can you be seen with, like Jim Jones and Eppolitos and so forth? But the Intertel organization, the Justice Department people, the members from the crime force, the CIA, the FBI have taken the profits and from crime and put them into their own pockets and investments and they're pushing the others out. So that's why a woman like Marilyn Baker can be close to the Bonanno family and their secretary and be an informant for the FBI and Charles Bates can uh, use crime figures like Mickey Cohn to uh, keep uh, Randolph Hearst informed where his daughter is but uh, keeps the crime level out of the picture while the FBI manipulates but uses crime organized crime whenever they need them. That's why Carlos Barcellos or Santa Traficana can be fingered for possibly being involved in the murder of John Kennedy, but John J. McCoy and Alan Dulles and Nelson Rockefeller and George DeMorenschild are not fingered or Lyndon Johnson. If you're going to have a conspiracy, use the crime uh, gang, and if they're ready to talk or get picked up, like Angela Bruno being gunned down at the time of the ab scam, or Sam Giacano about to testify before the House Select Committee, or John Rosselli having testified. If they're about to talk or going to talk, and you have these connecting links to the higher-ups, get rid of them at all costs so that we can continue uh, building our golf courses and recreation parks. There was an interesting death this last week, Gregory Bateson. Uh, some of you are very familiar with his name, New Solidarity, uh, newspaper put out by the Labor Caucus and Lyndon LaRoche. Refer to Bates and all the time as being one of the geniuses behind the mind control program that set up uh, events such as Jonestown or the SLA or the Manson family. Uh, the obituaries of Bateson are interesting. The local papers, I haven't gotten my Eastern papers yet on him. They describe him as being born in England and uh, studied anthropology. He went down to New Guinea 
He married Margaret Mead, and uh, then he went to Palo Alto. He taught at Stanford University. Stanford is going to be the big push, as I say, behind the fascism in this country and behind Ronald Reagan and the Hoover Tower, but they also have been instrumental in the mind control programs in California and the decisions that affect the whole world that permeate from California outward. Stanford Research, Stuart Brandt, the whole Earth Catalog working under Stanford uh, Tower, taking people away from political activity into the do-your-own-thing, space out and uh, drop out, don't ask questions and don't uh, don't care about the political world. Just get into your, uh, you know, separating your wheat and growing your own vegetables, which is fine, making your own bread. All of that is wonderful, but don't dare get political. Well, Bateson taught at Stanford University. He was at the Veterans Hospital in Palo Alto, which has been fingered as part of CIA recipients of mind control money. He was at Stanford and veterans until 1963. That's the time that John Kennedy was murdered. And then he surfaced again in 1972. The obituary describes how he went to University of California in Santa Cruz in 1972. Well, 1972 was the year that the SLA was formed, and then Colston Westbrook came home from Southeast Asia, trained in Korea and Southeast Asia in mind control, and went to Donald DeFries up at Vacaville, which was a center of government mind control, and DeFries had worked with the Los Angeles Police Department. So there was a can of espionage and intent and manipulation that I've well documented in my article, The SLA is the CIA, but the missing years for this uh, Gregory Bateson from 63 when John Kennedy was killed until 72 when SLA was formed are indeed missing. A uh, key to what he did or how much influence he had over these people would be where he was these years and maybe we'll get more information about his activities. He then went down to Esalen Institute at Big Sur. This was a legitimate home for the beatniks and for people like Henry Miller and uh, various writers that lived on the Big Sur coast. Uh, then it became very chic for the intelligence community who were very much into mind control to completely take over Esalen. It was too good a thing for the hippies to have, and the government stepped in on that and began to pollute that. Then he was active in the Zen Center in San Francisco and uh, just passed away last Sunday. Gregory Bateson's missing years and Charles Bates' missing years and the overlapping of these people, I'm sure, would be very interesting to pursue. But the effect of them is what you are going to feel. But I'm giving you the background. The effect of terrorism, uh, just as Adolf Hitler had arranged the Reichstag fire to round up the radicals and the uh, protesters or the political people in the country and claim that they were Marxists, terrorism will be the clue for the President of the United States, if it's Ronald Reagan, to take control or power, or he may even, or they may even be involved in an assassination of Jimmy Carter if they want this final push, because Reagan has been so groomed and trained, and he's so old, and this is their final push, and I'm not really sure at what point of desperation an assassination or terrorism uh, won't come off, that you won't be hearing about another gang or some murders of very important people to get the voters outraged before the next election. Henry Kissinger was over in Europe in April, and James Kilpatrick just had an article this week on vintage Kissinger. He went to a conference, a luncheon speech on totalitarianism and terrorism, and without a single note and only a few hours rest, he gave a brilliant description of terrorism. Well, Kissinger is from Germany, and he works with those people that are going to use terrorism as excuse to take away our civil liberties, and uh, Kissinger is too good an expert, according to Kilpatrick also linked himself with the CIA and the Defense Department. Said he's for, he's too good in foreign affairs, and Reagan is that's his weakest suit. Foreign affairs is Reagan's weakest suit. He shouldn't banish Kissinger. He should include him. Reagan should include him. It would be a great blunder not to have him. Look at Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, the Middle East, South Africa, Rhodesia, all the countries that Kissinger touched. Every one of them was a failure. And they want to put in a 70-year-old man who's low on foreign policy anyway and bring in an advisor who got us into this debacle with the Shah and these terrible situations of supporting Somoza, Nicaragua, uh, in Nicaragua and Paraguay and Nazis all over the world getting out Allende and putting in Pinochet in Chile. Kissinger's record is a total record of blunder. And uh, as Kirk Kilpatrick says, Reagan knows less. But his expertise now is 
totalitarianism and terrorism. And you can expect, as we get close to the elections, uh, some kidnappings and murders and some violence. Also behind Ronald Reagan's campaign, they not only want to do away with abortions completely, that will be more and more of an issue, the right to determine what you want to do with your own body. Uh, they're talking about reviving the Senate and the House watchdog committees. Senator Jesse Helms of North Carolina and possibly your Vice President Jack Kemp of New York are talking about the country being overrun with subversives Subversives, anybody who catches on to them, or national security is anything that endangers the corporations. Uh, remember those definitions because that's about what it adds up to. Uh, there were, they want, under the guise of people coming in from Cuba that could be counter-communist subver subversives infiltrating. I was wondering why Jimmy Carter let 100,000 Cubans come in. He won't let 100 prosperous Jews from Iran come to the United States, they're stuck in France, but he let 100,000 poor Cubans flee from Fidel Castro, and among those were 20,000 gays and 1,000 criminals, and um, now they're saying, what should we do with these people? They look at them as criminals, too. That was another one of Hitler's favorite little tricks, you know, is to take the gypsies or the gays and list them with the mentally deranged, and those were one of the first groups that he exterminated. Well, they bring these people in, and then they say, well, now that we're here, we need the House Internal Security Committee. They provided the boats, the citizenships, the jobs, and then that creates the excuse to take away our civil liberties on the guys that subversives have come in from Cuba. Bring them all in, and then because they're here, take away our rights. Uh, that is one of the things they're talking about at the GOP platform, and if it doesn't go through at the platform, uh, you'll get it later. That's why it was so important I mentioned last week to uh, take note of Regan. He wanted a little nicety that he have a czar of intelligence and not be supervised, appointed by him, and not approved by the House or the Senate. Another news item that is long overdue, I've had on my desk, I'm ashamed to say since March, but I have so many good articles here, I just I don't know when there will be time to get them. But because we're talking about Patty Hearst and that kidnapping and the FBI and Maryland, Baker and Charlie Bates of the FBI, who played such a major part in covering up the role of the Intelligence and Defense Department in Patty Hearst's kidnapping. There's an article by Harry Farrell in the San Jose Mercury, usually a conservative man who's getting scared, and a lot of middle conservatives are going to get scared as we get closer to Regan time. The article has to do with a bill in Sacramento by Lawrence Kapiloff, Bill AB2019, and the purpose of the bill... Uh, Farrell described as live in Sacramento is that the police would be prohibited from releasing the name of crime victims and witnesses. That You'd have to have permission from your corpse, I guess, to use your name if you're the victim of a crime. The excuse is it aims to spare crime victims anguish, more anguish than they suffered. And Farrell says this is a dangerous bill. The press must keep records open. We have to fight against this bill. It leads to the assumption unwarranted that the interests of crime victims are at odds with the interest of the public and the news media. We are proposing a law which infringes on the public's right to know, and when they evaluated the purposes of the bill, it appeared to be very dangerous. And Farrell goes on to say, any student of history will tell you there is an immediate social purpose served by keeping all the facts, specifically including the identity of the victim on the public record in any situation of crime or violence. He says, granted, it's unpleasant, but you could be mugged, slugged, shot, kidnapped. You could disappear, such as in Argentina or Brazil. You could disappear, and no one would know where you are. Now, that happens in Paraguay, Uruguay, Brazil, these Latin South American countries. You disappear, and nobody knows you're gone, so there's no concern, and wait four or five years, and the statutes would be off if you even had a court. But this article says you could be in the same situation as a lot of Jews and anti-Nazis, found themselves under Adolf Hitler just before they were shipped to concentration camps. The fo foremost safeguard for everyone's liberty in this country is the public record. If someone wants to do you in and do violence against you, there should be a record of the deed. And the article says, I can hear Mr. Kapiloff saying, well, this isn't Germany. We have civil rights. We have no Gestapo here. And Mr. Farrell, who's an editor of the San Jose Mercury, said, 
Huey Long was a virtual dictator in Louisiana. There was Archie Parr, the Duke of Duval, who ran Duval County in Texas. That's where LBJ got started. We have alliances between the cops, the police, and mob and organized crime, the Watergate burglary, excesses of the FBI and the CIA and the White House, such as the break-in of Dr. Fielding's plumbers. Had this bill been in um, a law, been made into a law, before Watergate, Dr. Fielding's name would not appear. The plumbers would not appear. It would be barred from printing the victim of the burglary or the victim of a crime, and the bill wants to leave the victim the decision of whether or not your name's in the paper up to you, but then you could be threatened by people to leave it out. The natural tendency of the police would be to drape a shroud of secrecy over every investigation at the outset, and this could be dangerous, and Farrell closed his editorial by saying it could become much easier, literally, to get away with murder. Somebody could be kidnapped, kept in a place, the neighborhood may not be on the look for that person, then they could be murdered, and days and weeks would pass before they could be saved, or they could be taken off to a detention place, uh, kidnapped and taken away and never seen again, and they could say, well, a kidnapper did it, so we didn't report it. This is a bill, be it was before the legislature in California to not take, suggest the victim or the suspect to keep everything quiet so that it would appear, I guess, that there's no crime or disappearance or murders or thuggings taking place at all. I received an interesting call just this week from a lieutenant, a police lieutenant in Austin, Texas. He asked me if I knew the name Bizzard, B-I-Z-Z-A-R-D. And I said, no. He said, do you know Mr. Pipkin? He was a friend of Bizzard. I thought this was a joke because the names were a little unusual, Pipkin and Bizzard. And I said, no. And they said, well, your name was among their possession, and uh, we have information that you make documentaries. Were you involved with the SDS in Austin, Texas? My first impulse was to be a little suspicious or cautious that uh, somebody was being implicated and they had my material around to link me to the case. I said, no, I never was involved with the SDS. Most of it was set up by the CIA to smoke out the left, and I didn't trust it, and I had no role. They said, do you make movies? And I said, no, I'm not a filmmaker. Are you an assassination buff? Yes, I study murders and I have homicides of all kinds, but I don't know anyone in Austin, Texas. The only person I know there is a woman named Marianne Waterhouse. She used to live here during the anti-war period, around 19... 67 or a little bit later she moved to california and went back to texas and the sheriff in austin said well marianne waterhouse is the widow of this mr bizzard who was murdered in 1967 to make a long story short mr bizzard was murdered uh in a 7-eleven store i think about five dollars were taken and the motive at the time was that it was a they need the money just a simple robbery the people in town, the anti-war activists, claimed that the police department had murdered Mr. Bizzard. So after all these years, from 1967 to 1980, they had a suspect. And I thought they had pulled in a Lee Harvey Oswald as a patsy and would close the case then to prove that the police weren't doing the work. But it turned out to be much different than that, much to my pleasure. And again, it brings in the question of people just about having enough and at some point you break with the establishment and begin to look at the facts it turns out that Bizzard was murdered and he was very active as I say during the anti-war movement and uh, the suspect that they have now is a hard ass uh, I suppose a Jew hater, a black hater, Chicano he's a member of the Klan he claims that he organized the Klan in Oklahoma they have him in jail they gave me the name of the suspect um, he was paid by Sun Oil Company. His mother worked for Sun Oil Company, and he bludgeoned her to death and cut her to pieces and lived off the income, her retirement income and Social Security, and traveled all over the world. He had multiple aliases and a lot of money and uh, traveled Mexico and up to Buffalo and various countries. And um, as he began to describe the suspect, I became a little more suspicious about the power of the man, and I wondered how he could... Uh, forged the dead mother's checks and they were coming in from Philadelphia again Philadelphia Sun Oil Company to him and they said well the Treasury Department went into the investigation of forging these checks and thought maybe he was forging them and then dropped 
the charges on the suspect. The Treasury dropped the charges. Then he threatened to kill Jimmy Carter. He lives in Texas, and he threatened to kill Jimmy Carter. And again, the Secret Service got in on this. And then they dropped the charges because the typewriter upon which the death note was written was dismantled, and so they dropped the charges on that. So I'm going to do a little more about this case on the other side of the tape because it's so interweaved with the research that I've done for the past 17 years and knowing Marianne Waterhouse, the widow of the man who was murdered, and the description description of the suspect and his links to the federal agency. It's very important to give you some of the pieces of this vignette because many of you know the background through the radio shows I've done through the years on some of these characters. Let it be a dance we do. May I have this dance with you? Through the good times and the bad times too. Let it be a dance. Let a dancing song be heard. Play the music. Say the words. And fill the sky with sailing birds. Let it be a dance we do. May I have this dance with you? Through the good times and the bad times too. Let it be a dance. Let a dancing song be heard. Play the music, say the words, and fill the sky with sailing birds. And let it be a dance. Let it be. This is May Brussel. It's side two of tape number 449, July the 11th, 1980. I suppose I can mention the name of the suspect on uh, the tape and radio the law enforcement gave me because he's charged with three murders, the blundering of his mother. He's been investigated for that, taking the checks as I say, from Sun Oil and the Treasury uh, Department. Um, uh, his name is Mr. Zaney, Z-A-N-I, and he's in jail, Robert Joseph Zaney. And when I began to talk about Austin, Texas, and the background of him or in the, and the main suspect they have now, they're linking the ballistics, a gun he had, to the killing of Buzzard and his claims of, um, I guess, bragging about some of the things he had accomplished, and he was picked up on a minor charge and put in jail, and then they began to investigate these other matters. When they talked about Austin, Texas, I said, could he by any chance have been near the Whitman boy at the tower when he went berserk and killed all those people down on the campus? Because that was the beginning of mind control program in the United States or the excuse for what would be the Mengele's genocide program that would continue through Dr. Delgado, Navy intelligence, uh, creating robots and zombies, and also the electrode implants, the transponders that are to put into black prisoners and other citizens and uh, other kinds of prisoners, and the use of satellites for prisoners and prison control and mind control, uh, the uh, machinery for allowing the experiments to begin with Dr. Mark and Irvin and Dr. Sweet at, in Boston, in Massachusetts Hospital, uh, working with Dr. Delgado, Delgado was that in the 60s, in the late 60s, there was violence uh, and riots of blacks, and that if we could take the brains of people and find out what triggers them to violence, and somehow in this mash of cells is something that triggers you to violence, if you erase that, they would be docile and sweet. And the brains of the Whitman boy were sent, uh, this was Elliot Richardson, I called him the um, later the Attorney General of the lobotomies. I wrote articles about him. Elliot Richardson and uh, John Conley and these people got the idea to take the brains of the Whitman boy and examine them and then apply this to riots in Detroit and Newark and around the country, Watts and so forth, of the blacks. And I felt that the Whitman boy was under control. And he also had negatives and pictures I read that were taken Clinged out of his apartment. There's always these Marilyn Bakers that come into Artie Bremer's apartment, the SLA house, the Harvey Oswald's room. They find these incriminating diaries and confessions and so forth, write books about them. But um, I felt that there was something that linked 
this particular zany to the Whitman shooting and the law officer in Austin told me that, yes, indeed, he knew the Whitman boy. He's mentioned him. He talked about him, that he was studying humanities, arts and humanities on the campus when Whitman was there and has made reference to him. And all of a sudden, I got a picture of a very high agent using P.O. boxes only, never home addresses, multiple aliases, security uh, retirement checks, business retirement checks of a deceased person who's been murdered, uh, free from prosecution by the Internal Revenue for forging checks, free from threatening the death of the president. Um, this is a very important person, a natural for killing a simple civil rights leader like Bizzard, but even bigger. And as we talked and went at length about his links and his special favors and his traveling and his mobility, um, I became more concerned that they really do have a big fish and that they should watch him closely and investigate those three murders. And, of course, if you look up the source of the checks that were coming to him, and he mentioned this to me, they came from Philadelphia. Again, I've done many tapes and broadcasts on the links of the Philadelphia connections to the Kennedy assassination, to Abscam, to Princess Grace and in Monaco, and the arms suppliers of weapons, Mr. Cummings, who went from Philadelphia to the CIA to London and supplies all the major uh, so-called terrorists that Kissinger gives lectures about, such as Carlos, and the famous counterintelligence terrorist. Uh, Cummings supplies the weapons. The news media plays up the terrorists. Kissinger gets paid to give the speeches. Then the House American Activities is formed to, quote, get the terrorists. And the Sun Oil, of course, have offices. There's the Arabian Sun Oil, the Bahamian uh, Sun Oil, Argentine Sun Oil, the Carib, the British, Ecuador, Iranian, Pakistan, Libya, you name it. Sun Oil is in every single one of these countries. And uh, checks were coming to this character and there was much involvement of Philadelphia in the assassination of John Kennedy. And what, the important thing about this character is once when he was overseas and they were threatening to arrest him on a certain charge, and he was traveling, he made a threat that he would sell to a foreign government information about the USA that would bring this country down to its feet. It was detrimental to the USA. And, of course, the biggest story detrimental to the USA is the murder not of Mr. Bizzard, in Austin, Texas, but the killing of John Kennedy nearby in Dallas, Texas. And I feel that the links of the Kennedy assassination to counterterrorism, to mind control, Jolly West, Jack Ruby's lawyer, doctor, uh, being the head of UCLA Neuropsychiatric, working with these people. There is a ball of wax that I have studied that started with the John Kennedy assassination, then it went in to the fake terrorism and the use of the Nazis and the Tsars for that. And mind control and mass mind control is an excuse for more control such as down at the University of Texas in Austin, Texas. This fellow that is in jail right now, this suspect is in uh, on suspect, uh, he's suspect of three particular murders and has not been charged with the federal crimes that he should. Uh, therefore, I feel the prosecution on the others might be weak and he'll be out. When I knew Marion Waterhouse, she had remarried and moved out here shortly after her other husband was dead. I don't recall her ever mentioning the fact that she had a husband active in civil rights. She came out here and was in the Peace and Freedom movement and knew people that I knew in the Peace and Freedom, Louise James and others, and I believe they were here at the time of the Presidio trial, the mutiny trial against uh, defendants. They were complaining about one of their buddies in the stockade that had been murdered by the military police and the, the people of the stockade that protested were charged with mutiny against the federal government. I think they came out here at the time and then they went back to Texas. And uh, the time that they came out here in 76 is when Charles Winan came out here. Charles Winan is a fellow I've mentioned on many tapes. Melvin Belli, the attorney for the Hells Angels, the Nazi gang squad uh, at the time of Aldermont, that concert, Mrs. Goering's attorney, the notorious bell, I was the attorney for Charles Winan in a case where Paul Krasner and the Rolling Stones had published an article saying Winan was involved with Navy intelligence and military intelligence. He was a neighbor of mine who uh, supplied drugs, been charged or allegedly supplied drugs for the Manson family and for the military counterintelligence. And then it became clear as I talked to the sheriff, uh, Mr. Watson, Charles Watson, who did all the murders in the Sharon Tate home, and the LaBianca home that Charles Manson was blamed for but hadn't done the murders, also came out from Texas. 
We had a big migration of people from Texas that broke up the music scene, the hippie scene, the hitchhikers, discredited the youth, brought blood and violence and hard drugs and killings to break up the crowd that were visibly anti-war protesters. Now, if we get a war in the Middle East, I don't believe that they can effectively break up people now. Their demonstrations against uh, the nuclear plants, and I've been at a demonstration where there are 100,000 recently down here in San Luis Obispo, and there was no violence and no uh, drugs or poisons handed out. They couldn't do it as well as they did in those days because most of us even are a little wiser, and even though it's a new generation, I think we've been turned uh, to look at some of the problems that broke up these organizations and people and possibly steer clear from the pitfalls the next time. But this big fish is caught. Interesting names. Uh, names are unusual. Robert Zaney and Mr. Pipkin and Mr. Bizzard. I thought it was out of a Dickens story or a novel, but it's so bizarre that it beats any novel that you're going to pick up anywhere today. Out of Iran and from Moscow Radio, I have a friend in Salinas who t- listens to shortwave Every night from Moscow, they're talking about the assassination teams that are being smuggled into Egypt. They're getting ready for the Shah to die if he isn't on cold storage already. I thought maybe Jimmy Carter's trip to Japan, he would stop over in Iran on the way back, but I guess that's out. But uh, the Shah was supposed to be on deep freezer in coma, and they're digging the coffins. And the reportedly, Iranian assassins have come in, and they're going to try to wipe out the whole family and infiltrate at the time of the funeral of the Shah. The story is that they're going after Princess Ashraf, that's the twin sister of the Shah, and of course uh, wiping her out would again wipe out one of those links to narcotics in the Middle East, that golden crescent that they're fighting for that turf over there. Um, members of the family have been killed. The nephew of the Shah was killed in Paris last year, but now the story around the marketplace is when the funeral takes place, there's going to be a big bang bang in Egypt the New York Post is carrying some wonderful stories about the team that tried to rescue the hostages in Iran Uh, listeners from New York have sent me these and they're just invaluable they're so large I wish they were condensed so I could send them to all of you they're written by Bernard Bard and B.T. Russell and the gist of these articles they're in several parts are about Captain Beckwith he's the man that headed the special forces uh, that failed to get the hostages but was assigned to get the hostages. And the important thing was that Beckwith was trained, aside from the Pentagon, in a special unit called the SAF, the Special Air Force Service. And the way they were trained was by reading a book by Otto Skorzeny. He was one of the top Nazis with Adolf Hitler. He was temporarily in jail. He was released uh, in 1948 when Israel became a country. He was well out of jail and on his way to Egypt to speak with Nasser and Sadat about setting up the Borman Brotherhood to do in Israel someday. Beckwith kept a book with him by Skorzeny, that was his hero, uh, to study the way the Nazi special commandos worked, and he had a special regiment of men. In the United States, working at age 32, this article explains, he started in 1961. Again, these time slots are so important. He began in 1961 training uh, in an obsession of, over the SAS, and he worked with a man, Lieutenant David Cole, who presented the scores and he booked with him, well underlined and noted, and they began training. First Beck was, was at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Then he moved to uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Uh, the Green Berets were there, and this is where his special forces were trained. Beckwith was first at the University of Georgia and then graduated and made a career of the Army and uh, began his work in 1961. One of these articles tells about the things that they were trained to do and that Fort Bragg had an organization for the direct action unit for the purpose of assassination. And they were going to train first at Fort Leavenworth in the heartland of America, and then at Fort Bragg they were going to set up this assassination unit. Beckwith, according to this one article, felt that the training program was the core of SAS, Selective course. It was a special course of special men that would fly in and do important jobs. Of course, Scorzani was uh, instrumental in rescuing Mussolini from the top of a hill. Um, This was his claim to fame or his feet before Mussolini was finally captured and hung by his heels. The fact that Beckwith 
uh, read Scorzani's book on how they captured Mussolini isn't important. It's what did the Italians do with Mussolini once they got their hands on him. Well, this article, is, as I said, is a series on Charlie Beckwith, a very important series in the New York Post, just run this last June. Hopefully it'll be in a book about the training of this U.S. Army officer and his assassination team and the work of the Special Forces at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. He was sent to England as part of his program of training and then back to Fort Bragg, South Carolina, to set up this unit. I don't know how many of you remember, because I take so many new listeners every new week, new people are listening, uh, to a radio broadcast I did in 1974. That goes back six years. Many of you probably don't remember that. Uh, about James Frankenberry. I got a letter from a man. This was two years after the Watergate arrest, a year and a half after the Watergate arrest. They were in June of 672. A man named James Frankenberry who was trained at Fort Bragg, uh, North Carolina, in a special forces group. He doesn't mention Beckwith, but he mentions other names. And I'm going to read the letter to you because I got it six years ago and because Beckwith's name is in the news now with his special team that was groomed with underlined books of Hitler's men for their training and set up these assassination teams. This is the letter I got in 1974. Uh, Dear Mrs. Brussel, he'd gotten a hold of my article uh, on why was Martha Mitchell kidnapped and the use of Nazis and counterintelligence to take over this country. It was the Watergate first published article I did. He said, I enlisted in the Army March 18, 1962. That's just, John Kennedy was killed November 63. I want you to keep your time slot straight. I had basic training in Fort Ord, California. That's just around my back door here. Then went to Fort Benning, Georgia for jump school. Beckwith also was down in Georgia and then up in South Carolina. In September of 1962, I was assigned to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. That's just almost a year before Kennedy was killed. And Beckwith admittedly was setting up assassination teams in North Carolina. He said, I was interviewed during October 62 and in February 63 by two warrant officers. We met in a small Spanish cafe near a train station, and we agreed to special weapons training for an overseas assignment. They told me I was going to Germany, flown into Riga, Larvia, USSR, for an assassination case that I was supposed to do for the Pentagon. I had confidential clearance, and they said I could refuse the assignment, but if I refused it, keep quiet. The Riga operation that he was supposed to go into entailed uh, going into the Soviet Union and infiltrating a CIA team that was supplying weapons in the Soviet Union for a rebellion. The warrant officer said that I, one, no one would believe me if I ever said anything about this anyway. This was in 1962, and no one would. As I said, the Pentagon Papers broke things open in 71, but in 62, they told him no one would believe him if he said anything anyway, and if I did, I would be placed incommunicado and be given treatment. This goes back to uh, Beauvoir's book, Operation Mind Control, and the government was well into treatment at that time. He wrote, within the last few years, an effort has been made to seriously neutralize my position, because he didn't go along with it. They attempted to say I was incompetent. Once in 1969, they tried to transfer me to Springfield Medical Center, where their assertions could be proved to be untrue. During February 63, I was told my assignment was going to be inside the United States by February of 1963. And the target was to be Major General Edwin Walker. Now, later in the month, somebody else was chosen for the job. The important point I have to interject from his letter is this. Major General Walker worked with the Nazis in Germany and with the people behind Ronald Reagan's campaign for president right now, the very, very far right. And General Walker sat in his window in April, a month later in 1963, and a shot went out and two men fled and they took a bullet out of the bookcase that couldn't be positively identified to Oswald. But then uh, Marina Oswald helped the Warren Commission and the FBI and CIA and said that Lee Harvey Oswald tried to kill General Walker. And then the motive for the Kennedy assassination was, being as Oswald didn't like Walker, who was right and Kennedy was left, he didn't like anyone So he was a frustrated man who couldn't get off as much sex as John Kennedy, and therefore he shot him. That was about the reasoning. It didn't fit the ballistics or anything. But the point is that Frankenberry mentioned that they were going to shoot at Walker, not kill him, 
but shoot, that there was a training group inside the United States, like the Reichstag, to set up the shooting of a far-right man so they could blame a left. He said, in 1969, I later learned that Oswald had tried to shoot Walker. He had never gotten a hold of a Warren report or Warren report, uh, the commission report, and my suspicions increased to what happened in 1963. June 63, three months after the shot at Walker, I was reassigned temporarily to Fort Meade, Maryland, and briefed by a man that I now recognize since Watergate was E. Howard Hunt. This identification uh, grew with knowledge that Hunt was involved with other assassination conspiracies, especially one in 1954. That had to do in Guatemala, and also he was involved with the Iranian crisis that put in the shop. While at Fort Bragg, South Carolina, he said there were five trainees selected for the latest job that was in June 1963. Now, I'll give you the name of the trainees that were in his letter because someday you may find their name linked to Beckwith's name in these articles that are coming out about Beckwith or books. It may be possible that you may see the name of somebody he trained with, and if you did, then you know that this team was being used for the assassination of John Kennedy, trained at Fort Bragg, South Carolina, as Mr. Frankenberry told me they were, and it would link to these special forces that were trained by Scorzani and his books and Nazi literature. He said the people he worked with, one, they worked in teams, Robert Fleming, James Kelly, Peter Marchand, and Robert Lawrence, and myself. There were five people trained for the job of uh, assassination at, while at Fort Bragg, South Carolina, and there were three teams of five each. This was his team. We were given terrain training, stalling procedure, sniper weapon familiarization. Then we participated in what was known as Operation Thereon, T-H-E-R-O-N. The training ground was Camp David, and we were to assassinate a foreign dignitary. The target was made of rubber and traveled on a railroad-like affair. We had two bullets, special composition to explode and mark it clearly on the target we hit. We were told we had to get a headshot. I have quite a long file of correspondence from Mr. Frankenberry. Some of it came out of a, a law group that forwarded his mail from the Atlanta Federal Prison, Atlanta, Georgia. I haven't heard from him for a long time. You can imagine uh, being in Atlanta, Georgia, and taken to a prison, having this kind of information, uh, what his chances were of surviving. This is the problem even in a free nation where you can say that somebody disappears or isn't seen or is locked up in a prison. You have the right to print it so that we know, but the media also uh, is not aware of a lot of these characters or primary witnesses to trials, and therefore uh, when we see a name, it isn't linked to another case. And while Mr. Frankenberry could be in a Atlanta federal prison and we don't know what happened to him after that, Nobody has a chance to know that such a man as Frankenberry exists. And I did read a great deal of this. If you want more, you let me know, and I'll read you on the air some of the correspondence I've had or had with him and look up the last date that I ever heard from him. Uh, it said a picture of himself and so forth. He had a lot to say about the White House plumbers as the Nixon tapes came out and the Watergate story unfolded. The letter I read to you about the assassination team and the plans to kill a head of state that he found out was going to be John Kennedy um, later, I think should be very interesting in light of the articles coming out about the background of Mr. Charles Beckwith, because uh, having this special training in Georgia where uh, Mr. Frankenberry was, then being given these books by one of the most notorious Nazi war criminals uh, possible, uh, also makes it important to know that the guiding light for the police department, the Justice Department, the Special Forces, the Pentagon, is the military uh, Nazi regime of Adolf Hitler. That was par excellence, the group to emulate and to use their techniques. And with the exception of the goose-stepping and the armbands, everything else falls into place. Is it any wonder that Mr. Otto Winnegar from Germany is the head, or was the head historian, of the Pentagon, of writing Pentagon history, and sent the men from the Air Force and Army to write the Warren Report after John Kennedy was killed. And John J. McCloy from Chase Manhattan Bank, who is the High Commissioner of 
Germany and released the top Nazis in 1957, including dogs like Skorzeny and others. Uh, this team of Nazis, of American uh, cleaned up Nazis, the corporation Nazis, and the books of the Nazis inspiring Beckwith um, are interesting. And then to get a correspondence from a man who participated with these special assassination teams and for him to spell out, see, he spells out how they were planning to shoot General Walker, but he doesn't grasp the comprehension of the counterintelligence. He knows someone else will be blamed with it, and later he read that Oswald was blamed for trying to shoot General Walker. But the implications go even farther because uh, Oswald is linked to Russia and the KGB and the Soviet Union, and they don't tell you he's linked to Argentine and the Nazis and Navy intelligence or that the people who shot through Walker's window very conveniently missed him at close range on an April evening uh, but managed that wonderful feat of the headshot against John Kennedy. They don't tell you that these people were trained for a specific political purpose that can be used by the news media to turn our minds against other people and eventually set us up for World War III. Yeah, Beckwith, the article on Beckwith mentions how he returned to the United States from Europe, where he was in England at special training, in 1961. That was an important year in his life. His inspiration and his obsession was the SAS, that special service. Well, in 1960, again, Robert Mayhew from the FBI, along with Charlie Bates and Marilyn Baker and that gang, Charles Mayhew, the Irish FBI, uh, take over the Howard Hughes organization. He worked for the CIA counterintelligence and then met with organized crime to set up the assassination teams that later were going to kill John Kennedy and a lot of other people. 1960, when Kennedy was to get the nomination to be president of the United States, was when the teams were set up to murder anybody who ran against Richard Nixon and uh, pushed Nixon out of office. Nixon and Reagan were selected a long time ago. The assassination teams were set up in 1960, and then Beckwith could get busy in 1961 with his special forces in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and the special forces were trained with well equipped assassination experts and the silencers and all the weapons and techniques and the planes and the technology for getting out of town and also the techniques of having officers used who later the media could create patsies and cover up their murders. They had to work hand and glove knowing that they were being trained for these murders that the media was blaming somebody else. They had to work hand and glove with people like um, Adolf Ox of the New York Times who believed that his paper was an extension of the federal government. I was talking uh, last week on several tapes about the Los Angeles Police Department, uh, the death squads in Miami, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, and Brazil. Again, patterned by Reinhard Galen after Hitler's intelligence and Gestapo and trained in Panama at the School for Police. Well, just this week, Congress is asking for a panel, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, to crack down on police brutality. What I'm talking about, the LAPD, in particular, I know, or certain other cities in particular, such as Dallas and um, the jail, you know, opening up the jail to Jack Ruby to kill Lee Harvey Oswald, this kind of uh, behavior of the police departments, but mostly, again, not only witnesses to trials, but against the minorities, it's no longer a California problem. I was trying to work on that at the time that I learned Donald DeFries worked for the police department, and Louis Tackwood of the LAPD became a friend of mine. He wrote Glasshouse Tapes to Expose the Police, Tagwood at a press conference in 1971 saying that the White House, the CIA, the FBI had a Gestapo, a link with the police department. And that was in the Washington Post, the New York Times. He wrote a book, The Glass House Tapes. But now, that was 71, this is nine years later, they're asking U.S. Commission on Civil Rights to do something about police abuse, and they have a report now on police practices and the preservation of civil rights that Indeed, the Chicanos, the blacks, the Indians, the minorities, and the witnesses to trials are being murdered, and the police department uh, go away free and wipe out very important witnesses that could change the history of our country if they were allowed to talk. Uh, the brutality of the police on the minorities is outrageous, and it is so bad after the Miami shootouts that cost millions of dollars, $100 million in riots, and not to count the 18 persons that were killed, and the country's ready to erupt again, and now they say, okay, it isn't a city problem. It's not up to the city council in Los Angeles. It's a national problem, and the national police force 
much must account why they have no minorities, why they go after the blacks, why they're killing the labor leaders, and so forth. Um, it's become a national problem. And finally, nine years later, it's proposed to the Congress that they take a hold and examine the police department. They might just start in Dallas, where John Kennedy was murdered, and Memphis, Tennessee, where Martin Luther King was murdered, and Los Angeles, where uh, Robert Kennedy was murdered, all police departments linked to organized crime figures and to the Central Intelligence Agency and the FBI, working with those hit teams that come out of Fort Bragg, South Carolina, and with the newspapers that cover up the real assassins and keep projecting that lone assassin BS stuff that we get over and over. Or they can do like the police in Indiana when Vernon Jordan was shot and almost killed the head of the Urban League recently. They can say, it looks like a conspiracy that there was more than one person ambush was set, but we won't go looking for it. In other words, there's no more telltale diaries or lone conspiracies. They say, yeah, it's a conspiracy, but we don't have a lead. Uh, now they admit there's a conspiracy, but they don't have a suspect. There's no way to hold that clock back. It's the end of an hour again. Uh, we'll just have to continue next week as some of these important stories but this is Mae Brussel in Carmel, California, and you take care, and I'll be back with you next week with some more information on these lovely characters. Let it be the dance we do. May I have this dance with you. Through the good times and the bad times, too. Let it be a dance. Let a dancing song be heard. Play the music. Say the words. Let it be a dance, let it be a dance.